My name is Dr. Henry Lustigerthaler. This is a joint inter interview project between the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and the Kleiman Holocaust Education Center, uh, now known as the Amut Esh Memorial Museum. And today I'm speaking with Mrs. Hadassah Karlbach. Mrs. Karlbach, where were you born? I was born in Leningrad, although on my official papers there's another city and there's an inter interesting story attached to it is that those years were very difficult years for Jews in Russia. My father was a Hasid of the previous Lubavitch Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Schneerson. And uh, the Rebbe at that time was arrested and a couple months later was released and was in Leningrad. So as many uh, Siddim as possible gravitated to Leningrad to be with the Rebbe. He was there for a couple of months. And every time pe people would ask my father, how old is your daughter? He would say that the Rebbe left Leningrad in the year Pei Zion, that's the, the Hebrew uh, numbers. And so that I, for many years, I wasn't sure exactly how old I was. There was also another problem that my father was not registered in Leningrad, and possibly he wouldn't have gotten even permission to be there if he would have attempted to uh, get a, uh, be registered. And my mother was due to deliver, but no hospital would accept her because they weren't registered. Hmm. Until they finally, at zero hour, they found a private doctor who could not take her into his office because he was worried about his license, but some sort of a make makeshift place in the middle of winter in January, he, de he delivered this long-awaited baby that they awaited seven years for, or, you know, finally. And, and there was no and I wasn't registered. I was officially, I wasn't born then. When, when the rebel, when I was six months old, is that when the rebel left Leningrad, my father went to visit his sister. Uh, her, her name. You, you give me a second, I get senior block. We can come back to it later if you like. She was married to Eber. I'll come back to it in a minute yeah. because it's, uh, it's, it's uh, important. And they lived in Ukraine in Neville. Mm -hmm. At that time, my aunt was pregnant, and she gave birth to a boy, assisted by a, a midwife. Mm -hmm. For a couple of rubles, the midwife gave a certificate to my mother that she had a baby there to and put, give me my name, and so that I was Officially born in Neville, a different time, a different. <laughs> right, I have to always remember. It's a good story. For official, for official papers. So we're back in Leningrad then. Yeah, and so we we left. Well, from then on, we did not return to Leningrad uh -huh. anymore, which was off limits anyway for most for mm -hmm. Jews. Mm -hmm. And we 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 were uh, we went to Moscow. A lot of my stories, my a lot of happened on trains 
rest of the world because they were traveling frequently as my father was working illegally for the Freda Karevi. Uh, his, his job was to channel the funds that came illegally from from the United States to the needy Jews in Russia. Mm -hmm. And that's dealing with foreign currency was a, 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 the punishment would be very, very harsh. So at that time he changed locations frequently. But then for a short time we lived in a suburb next to Moscow, Malachovka. And um, my brother was born five years after me, my brother Shalombert. And our house was always open to Hasidim who needed a place to sleep over and to rest for a while that we're running away from, from the Gestapo, or not, excuse me, from the um, GPU, it was at that time, the uh, Russian, uh, Russian, uh, whatever those letters stand for, for the Russian police. Mm -hmm. Many, many times, uh, there were, the, the, the house was full of illegal people. And I remember that my father did something that was a game he played with me. And he said, tonight, you know, it's going to be fun. We're going to be sleeping on the porch, except it was the middle of winter in Russia. We were sleeping on the porch so that to, to be able to alert the illegal people inside to leave by the back door in case the uh, uh, rush, uh, the GPU comes to uh, to the visit. secret secret police and and they came frequently hmm. they came frequently my father writes in one of the papers and I don't know exactly but <coughs> I think he says that they, I may be one or two off, that he was arrested 16 times in Russia before we left Russia. Hmm. And I, one, it, it, and they used to come to the house all the time, ask questions, they get you, and one specific interrogation that as a child I witnessed that remained so much in me is my mind is while they were speaking to my father, I don't know, I wasn't privy to the questions they were asking, but my brother was in proximity because the, the place was very small, you know, it is like a, it, it probably uh, 300, 400 square feet, the whole apartment, I mean, it was just a... And my brother was standing in a crib and singing, he loved to sing. To this day, he love, he's sick, but he loves to sing. And he was singing and shaking the crib, and he was only about a year old, and he was singing the same song all over and over again. And interesting, the song is called Karne Roshaim Agadea, which means that I will take away the power of all the wicked people. After a while, it started being very annoying to the people, that, to the guys that were interrogating my father. And they asked my father, what is he singing? And my father said, some children's song, you know, something. And many times my mother had to leave us alone 
in the house because she had to do some errands also that were illegal and for my father and help my father and and many times she would see them the uh, she she would see the people coming through the window and she would leave me with my brother just like that and she would go out the the back try to warn warn my father this was about till I was about five six years old but I remember also there were wonderful times and there is when we had for bringing in our house it's like my father was always a leader where people congregated around him and so it, when it was Simchat Torah and and the Chassidim came, and it it was joyful, very serious. He was a very serious person, so Simchat Torah was was not Purim. There was a big difference bet, between of them. Simchat Torah was something high. Very so the dancing in the house later on, even when we were in Moscow, we had also a small shul in the house. And I'll always remember the Simchat Torah. I remember for because I even felt like when I was witnessing the dancing that there, that there was some that these people who were dancing. Was, were transcending something. I couldn't understand what as a kid, but I remember crying that I couldn't get it. What is it? What is it happening in this in this room? And this was illegal, all the time illegal. You know how that was times that the work that my father was d doing was so dangerous that he had to travel from one place to an, to another to distribute the money. And it was in a suitcase, and they would the suitcase would be locked and when there was an inspection, and they started looking through the lo they want to see what's in the luggage, why are you going? Where are you going? Where's your luggage here? What's in that suitcase? The answer would be they were trained to, to, to say that. I don't know. I stole it. I don't know. I don't have the key. It made the key disappear. I don't know what's inside. Many times when it's caught, I was goodbye to the money. And may I just ask this? In the in the apartment, as you just described it, uh, three hundred and fifty square feet. This one was a little bit larger. I must. It but must. just outside Moscow, how many how many um, people were there staying? How it many? Was, uh, you, you must have had a. It, it, got, it just, got, would get filled up very quickly. Uh, it, 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 just my brother, my, my parents, and my brother lived there permanently, and then all the. Uh, look, I remember not having a pillow to sleep on. Mm. Only, or, but that could even be later. But even the same thing there. But I remember when I had the mumps that nobody wanted to sleep in the bed with me because I had to share the bed with many people, with many women there. But when I had the mumps, I had the bed for myself. That was a big event that I could have the bed and a pillow for myself. You know, there was always, always somebody, somebody. So, so this is basically that my father considered himself a, a soldier, that he was a soldier of the Friedrich Rebbe. And a soldier does what he has to do and is not afraid, cannot, cannot show fear doing it. I think this was a training for much later when he had to deal with the Nazis, that this came in and handy this kind of attitude in this. So we, we 
in, in, in 1935, where the, the interrogations were so frequent that my, and, and, and the Frida Kerebe was already for a long time out of Russia that my father decided it's time to, to think of his family and see if, see if he can uh, get papers to, uh, to leave Russia. I'm, I'm just curious. You mentioned that your father, um, with this suitcase of money, would be traveling frequently to distribute the money. So yeah. he was going to other towns and cities. And was, yeah. do you know that was he going to these underground yeshivas that we hear about at that time, or to where I, was he? What, what I, were the institutions, or they were particular individuals? I don't Rabunam? know exactly who he had, so who he made contact with, but I knew that this was money that came from the from the joint from a. United States. Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly. So, Look, so your father, did you, did I mean, you see you know joint, what, joint people coming? Uh, did you see people from the joint coming to your apartment? No. It was, they, they were, that would be too dangerous for right, anybody right, right, for right. them to come. There's no way that they would come. But there's, I'll get to it, there's one name that I knew our contact person was, was Dr. Rosen, Joseph Rosen. Very, very special person. But, but, he was uh, your contact in uh, the Soviet he, Union? He's from the United States, and he's the one who, start, who, who proposed to, to the uh, Soviet government at that time to create a, um, a, a Jewish farm place in Birobidzhan out, out of, out of uh, Russia. He tried to, this way, get some, save some Jews. But coming back to so that our house was also the hub where applications were made for exiting exiting Russia, uh, because my father was very literate. He spoke a beautiful Russian, a literary Russian, and he wrote a, a, a literary Russian. So. I was very familiar with all these papers that were being, uh, all the applications were being always written in our house. Every application usually was refused many, many, many times un unless, unless they uh, gave up on the person and said, okay, go. The only place they could go was to Palestine in those days. They would, Russia would not allow anyone. To, to go to Europe or to the United States. Palestine is because you wrote always that you want to go to Kevarabot. You want to die where your forefathers are. You want to go to that country because you want to go to... That was the, the reason why you want to exit Russia. And they were especially strict with intelligentsia. They did not leave, let intelligentsia leave. Russia, and especially not because my father's name of Schneerson, and they still connected him to the previous Rebbe, that was, a, you know, a, a, a criminal in their eyes. He was working for Judaism against the state, you know, so that was very difficult. After being refused so many times, like I think about six times, the seventh, this, had to, they reapplied the seventh time. And, uh, and it was okay. I have here a passport picture of my mother and, and my brother and myself. And we had to look like peasants. We should not look like somebody that they would desire to, to keep in Russia. So, the, so, and then it was another thing is you had to get as you would get to have uh, passage ship ship shifts carton that was the buzzword all the time shift how are we getting shifts carton 
So the Dr. Rosen from the Joint sent the uh, uh, passage, ship passage, and we're ready to go, and it's just before Pesach, and and my father said, how are we going to go before Pesach? We're going to be Pesach on the ship, on the boat. And my mother knew how dangerous it is. She said, go, go, we'll go, we'll, we'll, we'll make it, we'll, we'll, don't worry about it. So we are packed up matzah and wine, and there was still a Shabbat before Pesach, and we are on the, on the train from Moscow to Odessa, where we have to take the ship. And three minutes before the train is to depart, the GPU agents are on the train taking my father, come with us. And my mother's lost, what am I here with two small children? What am I doing? And my father says, go, go, I'll catch up to you, go. So we arrived in Odessa for Shabbos, and it was Shabbos. You're not supposed to be sad, but it was <laughs> quite a sad Shabbos. We didn't know if my father is arrested. If we're gonna make it, if we're gonna make it. It's, I think. I think that the, the ship was due to leave on Monday. He made it. He made it. Just he talked himself out. That was his strength, that he somehow, he, he probated them a lot. He, he, he did not, he was telling them that you're talking nonsense, where'd you get that stupid information, or this guy is a liar, whatever it is. Thank God he made it. We were on the way to Palestine. That's the next chapter. When we are we arrived to Jaffa. May I say on on the uh, ship. Twelve days. Twelve days, ship. and we were Pesach on the ship. We arrived. We arrived. I know we arrived Chalomo at Pesach uh -huh. to Israel. A lot of people on the train. A uh, ship, rather, excuse me. It was a small ship altogether. Hundred people. Mm -hmm. It was a small ship. It was uh, my mother was sick all the time, seasick on on the on the, uh, on the ship, on this voyage. When when we arrived, uh, I, the the uh, the uh, what I remember first thing is the taste of a banana, uh, the smell of an orange, a grapefruit, all these things that I never had before, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was very, uh, it's amazing, and these things were kosher for Pesach, right there, we got a, we were off the, off the boat, off the boat. Uh, we, uh, we had, we had a play, place in Tel Aviv, my, f my father was not comfortable there. Uh, uh, Palestine, before it was Israel, especially during that period, was so socialistic that they were practically communistic. They think they thought they still thought communism is wonderful. Somehow, they did not connect what's happening to Jews in Russia with 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 communism. But and and there, at that time, there were two two of the main rabbis. I think one was Rab, Rav Kook, and the other one. I have problem with names. Mm -hmm. Anyway, was, they, was they a, did was not. Was Rabbi Rabbi Herzog at that time? No, 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 came no, later. no. The other one who was a, a cook was very liberal. Mm -hmm. And, and the other one was more strict, and they did not get along with each other. Uh, 
And so uh, my father says, this place is not for me. I don't need the socialism, this communism. This is not what I came for. And among his papers, I found this this traveling paper, sort of a passport, where he has a visa to the United States in 1935. And he left us, my mother and my brother. He was there only 60 days in, his, in Palestine. And he went to, uh, on, the, on the way to, to the United States, he wanted to see the, the Rebbe, the Friedrich Rebbe, that he hasn't seen for so many years, since I was six months old. So he went through Europe, from Palestine to through Europe. He visited the Rebbe in, a, in uh, I don't know where it was, Atwatsk or Warsaw. They're close to each other. The Lubavitcher Yeshiva was in Atwatsk at that time. Mm -hmm. And then, in order to uh, go from Poland to the United States, you have to transfer all of Europe to take a ship from a French port through the, the Atlantic. So he took the train and arrived in Paris. And he stayed in Paris for a while, and he looked around and he says, you know, I could do a lot of work here. I don't have to go to the United States. Why go further? So he asked the, the, the rabbi what to do, and the rabbi says, Go ahead, stay there. So it was kind of difficult times for my father. He had no money. Yes. But he rented, he said, in order to accomplish here, this is not Russia, I have to I have I have to live differently. I have to present a, a different face to the French. He took an, a, a beautiful apartment, Rue Dies, and uh, got connected, connected himself with some Jews that were refugees from Poland, from uh, Czechoslovakia, from Paris. Not so much, not so many from Hungary yet, but some from Germany, because this, it was Hitler was already on the horizon. It's 1935, and uh, some felt that uh, economically and for their safety that they had to leave that uh, uh, Poland, and France was open to refugees. At, in, in, in their merit, I have to say that at that time they took in quite a lot of refugees. And so these Jews were not comfortable with the French body of, of, of rabbin, the rabbinate, the, the French body of rabbis, the official French rabbis, which are the consistoire. They were what we call Hamishagin. I don't know how to translate that. Mm. Uh, that's a good translation for Hamish. Uh, very uh, filled with tradition yeah. and, uh, and less and, with pomp and, and, and circumstance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very. I was about to say very approachable. Yeah, approachable. Yes. Exactly. So yeah. no pomp and circumstance. That's much better. You know the. Uh, French rabbinate, they were still wearing their clergy black robes mm. and, uh, of course, speaking in French, which is not an easy language for Polish Jews to, to pick up. 
<laughs> all, this, all this time, you were still in Palestine with your all the time I was mother still in Palestine. and brother. Yeah. Okay. We're still in so, Palestine. All right. So let's. So we. So we'll talk about that time in Palestine a little bit later. I just don't want to yeah. take you off your, your discussion okay. about your, your father right. right now. So, so I'll, I'll come to, to this in a minute because I'll try to do a little chrono chronology yes, here also absolutely. with my father. Absolutely. So uh, they started congregating around my father and my, and my father started helping out many. I think that at that time Dr. Rosen came through helping him with some money from the joint. And it's like the historian Harriet Jackson puts it so well. Well, my father was in Paris for a couple, for four months. He already opened canteens, kosher canteens for poor people. She said she didn't learn yet how to go by subway by metro from one place to another and he already had open canteens. That's that's the way how he operated. And then he got ten responsible people together and they gave him a, what they call a Ktav Rabbanut. That means they, they, they gave him a, a document that they are accept, nominating him a rabbi for themselves and their families. And so the, the, the third floor of that building became a shul, and, uh, and that's until 1932 or 36, where he sent away for my mother and my brother and myself during that time in Israel. My mother had a hard time. She, in order to survive, she sell, she sold some with his okay. He told her which for him, to, which books to sell because he took his whole library, a very extensive library, out of Russia with him, hmm. and that uh, she sold some of the books. I remember, she tried to make it for us children, very pleasant and. And she even made a sukkah for us on the roof of this uh, Achad Ham ap uh, apartment where we lived that she put up three, three or two mattresses and some corn husk on top. And this was our sukkah. And, and we left, we left uh, Israel a few days before Shavuot, and we were Shavuot on a ship called Champollion that, that docked in Marseille uh, on a Shabbat after Shavuot. But we were Shavuot on the ship. So one year we were Pesach on the ship, next year we were Shavuot, Shavuot on the ship. So these are our years in Paris. My father did not want to send me to the uh, Jewish school, which was kind of watered down uh, Hebrew, Jewish school with, with very light instruction. It was mainly created at that time so that the children should not have to attend public school on, on Shabbat because in France the, 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 uh, the days off from school were a Thursday and a Sunday and I think at that time Shabbat had to be in school. So, my, so we had, my brother and I had private tutoring And, uh, uh, we had a we had a, a, a rabbi. Uh, his name was Rabbi Rabbi Nis Nis uh, Lisan. 
Lisan. He was short, possibly a little hunchback, but he was a very, very kind person. And and then we had a secular teacher also, or secular subject. I think Rabbi Lisan was from the twentieth of a city Panavish. What other kind of activities was your father involved in in that 1936? Uh, oh, he was working right with these various uh, canteens. I, I and tell, there was a Talmud Torah, mm -hmm. and for afternoon, um, children who went to to school till four o'clock, and then they came to learn, but that wasn't like the Talmud Torahs in the States here. This was a real serious learning Talmud Torah. And, uh, and since, actually, since I was doing so well, I even re re remember that it put me in the, high, the highest grade, which was only boys, and they were learning Gemara. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but he did, uh, that there were kitch, ki, the the, uh, the soup kitchens, quite a few soup kitchens. There was matzah, providing matzah for the hand matzah instead of the uh, and and mostly and mostly machine matzah, but done in a very uh, careful halachic way and. Um, that was in 1936, and and then financial help to a lot of a lot of people, financial financial help, advising people to leave, helping them getting get, getting them uh, uh, passage on sh on ships, and so. When they say that, you know, a children's home, 80 people, I know that he helped so many other people leave France even before Hitler entered Paris, mm -hmm. you know, this, and, and even, uh, later on through, through the years also. So, uh, and there were the, the regular rab rabbinic duties. I remember people coming with a chicken, to, to, there was a problem, and they, you had to open your own chicken, you know. In those days, you had to flick, what I call this, uh, and, and then you opened and you cushioned it, and, and you got to check what's happening. And sometimes there was something that looked different. So there were this. There were marriages, and there were divorces, divorces the regular rabbinic, rabbinic stuff. Mm -hmm. But mostly is mostly centered around children and education. And education. Was it a very large congregation that your father had? You mentioned it started with ten people. It started with ten people, but then the shul it was much larger. Mm -hmm. it was a little, you know, it was, it, I don't know. I I would I would estimate like our Shabbos. It wasn't a, a big, a big room. It was uh, maybe one and a half times this area. Mm -hmm. It was about sixty, seventy people. Mm -hmm. on, on, on and it was, was um, and this was still being supported by the joint at that time, or it was being supported by no. He just was already supported by money that he fundraised uh -huh. uh, for that he did his own fundraising by the congregation and so on. And, and, uh, and so on. As we're moving into 1937-38, what was occurring in, in Paris at that time for you and your family? More of the same. More of, more of the same. Mm -hmm. More of the same. But, uh, Hearing about the news of uh, what was occurring in Germany at the time. and 
yeah. more Jews, I'm sure, coming out. 1938, a lot of there German Jews. Of, there were a lot of rabbis that that went through our, that visited us, and went through our house. Like who? Uh, our who? house was still one of the largest Jewish homes, a uh, house, uh, apartments in Paris. So I, I remember vividly for the Marshall Rebbe. One time, his sitim called my father. I listen. <coughs> Excuse me. We know you are a Lubavitcher, but would you host the Marshall Rebbe for a Shabbos? My father said, why not, of course. And so, and Moshitz is all about me singing, all about music. So Moshitz Rebbe came and Friday night, there was a tish or, or a meal for a lot of Hasidim. And the place was hopping, hopping, hopping. And I, to this day, I remember what, it was a new song that he taught them, and I remember the song even that he taught them. <coughs> oh, maybe. So you were mentioning that uh, the Rebbe was uh, introduced you to new music that you hadn't hadn't heard before. Yeah, I know, and and you know what? Although my father was a a, a, a true, so and true Lubavitcher Hasid, as kids we were not supposed to say or make a distinction. You know what? Some there's a silly thing that people used to ask. Who do you like better, your father or your mother? Which is, people are smarter now these days. They don't ask such stupid questions. But what are you, a chassid or a misnagat? Are you a chassid or anti-chassid, you know? My father said, don't ever answer that. Tell them you're a yid. And that's it. So my father was very open to it. Uh, everybody through, went through our house without Difference. He helped any, everyone. Chassid was nugget, different. It was no, no, no distinction. In this. So in Paris, your father was also uh, helping Jews leave Europe. That's right. So it was also. Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. And these were, I would imagine. Um, German Jews. Uh, th there Polish. were a lot of people that needed that extra push mm -hmm. and that needed the extra support financial because, the, the, you know, the, 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 it, it's hard to make decisions, you know. And then, you know, France uh, was friendly and uh, so. It, so we come to 1939, when the war broke out. So a lot of people used my father that word orphanage in connect, you know, connection to my. And but I don't like, I don't like that word uh, orphanage because it wasn't what it was all about. First of all, in those days, I mean, anybody economically better situated in France used, used to put their kids in boarding houses. It's a very common thing, mm -hmm. to, you know, to send for an education boarding house. And so there the were the non-Jewish boarding house, and then there was the Jewish organization OZE, uh, Children's Help Society, OZE, O-S-E. They were very famous. They worked in hand in hand with the ORT, 
That's the organization that was started in Russia. Mm -hmm. And Jose, when things became difficult for parents, Jose took, took in their children and their, provided them homes, for, uh, children's home, like for their children, for to the refugees. Their homes were not kosher. Jose was a secular society, very secular society. And so they, the, the Jewish family who kept kosher one needed a place where, where to send the children when Paris became threatened by, from the, by air, by bombing and so on. Mm -hmm. Everybody wanted their children out of Paris, send them to the country. So Jose had all these homes. So my father went, he was very good terms with the Jose. They were common from Russia yet, common friends. And he uh, said, okay, let me do one home together with you that should be under my supervision, kosher. You, you take care of all the business organization and every, provide everything else, and I will provide, make sure the food is kosher, and provide the teachers for the children that they should learn, keep learning, continue with their learning. So that's how they, it started the, the, the home, together with Jose, the first home. So the homes were, in fact, these, uh, the origin of them were these boarding schools as you mentioned. They, uh, this uh, almost were like, so like they were, boarding so, school. So in that sense... Because they, they, were were not, not, they were not really orphans. Orphans, exactly. Wasn't this also around the time that your father started the uh, L'Association des Israelites? Actually, I should have gotten back to it. He started it in 36, 35, 36. Uh-huh. He started that one. And how did that organization impact some of the work that he was doing? It was like an umbrella to all his uh, activities. Uh -huh. And he chose the word practical. He did not want orthodox. He did not want this. Practica means practicing. You know, you heard this, okay. And, and, and when they joined, he didn't ask them to see that scissors. Okay, I mean, he, anybody can join. Mm -hmm. That at one point or another, everybody would practice something. Right, of course, <laughs> really. of course. You know. So it was a very wise decision. It was yeah. a very wise decision. Yeah. So this this enabled him to have fundraising also. Exactly. That yeah. yeah. it didn't only come from orthodox yeah. sources through the UJA, etc. Yeah. So it was a wider a wider yeah. spectrum. So all the, um, all the homes, and there were so many homes in, in the south of France, yeah. all these occurred under l'association israelite de, de, de pratiquant. Yeah, there were sequential, there were, uh, well, uh, uh, some things overlapped a little bit, but mostly it was one home at a time, okay. Right. So the first one was in the Allier in Brouvernet. It was, uh, why was it in the Allier? Because the UGF, which is the uh, French Organization for Jewish Activities, it, 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 I don't know if they already were formed at that time, but that, that's, the Allier was this, I think Vichy was their seat. seat. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, so my my parents still rem my my parents sent my brother and myself there with a group of children. And uh, my my parents uh, stayed in Paris, almost till the invasion. 
because there were still Jews there and there was still like, work to be done and so on, so they said. And they came just a few days before Hitler invaded Paris. Okay. And they stay uh, they stayed in Vichy for a while. I have a few of the um the cities where um, the uh, so-called orphanages were, but some of them, I think, probably were in um, in Marseille. In Marseille, so I understand yeah. that there, in fact, they were not. I mean, oh. the parents were arrested. Oh, what, so one oh, at at one point, unfortunately, some of the children in Bouvernet, in the Allier, mm -hmm. became orphans. Mm. You know, but, but that was the first home, the first the home. The first home, right. someday. But, but that home stayed for a while, but my father left for, for Marseille because Vichy made, the, the German had their seat in, also the French cooperating with the German had their seat in Vichy, mm -hmm. so there was a, all Jews had to leave Vichy. So my father went to Marseille. In Marseille, a lot of Jews were in Marseille. No, I, I think, I don't know why so many Jews went down to Marseille. Um, I think it's because it was a port city where you can go further from there. Okay, and uh, so, uh, and the Germans were already picking off Jews off the street, and there were a, especially a bunch of teenagers at that time, mostly boys who were in great danger. They. They did not have the right papers, did not, whatever, you know. Their parents were, it's like they were semi-homeless. And worse than anything is that they had nothing, during the day they were doing nothing. They were, there was nothing to do, nothing on the street. So that's one thing all, all through the, the course of, the history with my father, um, doing nothing is a no-no. There it, it isn't such a thing. The, the day has to be organized. You have, you have to get up, you have to daven, you have to eat, eat, you have to eat like a Jew, you have to, uh, you, have to you know, learn, or you have to work. But the, so he created a, uh, a uh, school a radio technical school, and he took, and he always went for the top. He took a top engineer, Dr. Rastowicz, to teach the boys radio technology. And I remember join, joining them, and I remember taking apart old radios and winding the uh, the coils or whatever, and and learning the formula of resistance. But it kept these young men off the street, and then he took the, he did together with ORT, which is on uh, ORT was an organization to provide jobs for young for people. Mm -hmm. He he started making uh, he made a school for girls for uh, uh, pattern cutting, so dressmaking, and so and uh, and so on to get to get them occupied. So. So we we stayed there and and then most of the children from 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 the Allier, from the Vichy side, from the north, they they found papers. They left for the United States. Mm -hmm. Well, this so that place. Maybe Jose continued with that place, but my father was kind of finished with that place. So now he has 
this place in, in Marseille, and he needs a place to put up people overnight. And so, you know, these same young people are, oh, oh. So he took a place next to Marseille. It's uh, rented a beautiful little villa, like an Italian villa, gorgeous place. La Vieille Chapelle, it was called. I don't know mm -hmm. if you came across it. No, but it was that in the town of uh, Demu? No, that's before. That was before. Demu, Demu, Demu that, was before. That, so he or, still has his place in Marseille, but he also has this place, La Vieille Chapelle, which is I used to go by bicycle from one to another, which was uh -huh. like a 40 minutes bicycle ride. Was that, or, uh, bicycle. Huh? Was that Wa Wa No, that's Wa in the south. That's Marseille. That's uh -huh. here. That's Marseille. Marseille. Yeah. That uh, is in Marseille. And, uh, and, and he befriended the head of the uh, uh, of the uh, police of the department. That is the apartment Alp Maritime, I think. He befriended him. And what year are we in here? Nineteen forty. Nineteen forty. One. Forty 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 one. There was I don't know if you came across there was one hist historian, Leon Polyakov who, who uh, was my father's secretary. Mm. Uh, Leon Polyakov wrote many his history books of that time. He also wrote, wrote one book, La Berge des Musiciens, with a chapter devoted to my father. Mm. So he describes where my father is saying he's going to visit this head. His name was Roux the head of the uh, uh, police department for the area, and 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 Polyakov was acting. I said, how are you going in the lion's den? And my father said, I, I'm going, and he went, actually. And this is my father dressed with his beard, with his hat, with his long Hasidic garb, did not try to, in any way, to pretend what he's not, and and he visited, he visited. Later on, we found out that he was part of the resistance, this, that he helped us a lot, this rule. Because, at, at, of course, after a certain time, was it uh, 42, where, where the visits by, by the, by the uh, Germans were too frequent. They were visiting, looking for for, peop for people. Where Ruth said he was trying to deflect. Also, the there was French police that collaborated with the German. He had to protect us from the French police. Also, well, he said he, he cannot help us anymore. And but my father had already prepared a place a farm out in the country, Demi in a chair, the Park Manager, where where we could really keep our young people busy and sustain ourselves and be out of the eye of metropolitan area of the so we, we you want to continue so sure. So we, but the question is getting there. At that time, we were already 80 people. And it said this, this rule signed a, a permit, a blank permit practically, just putting 80, 80 people without itemizing, give us permission to move. But you had, you know, every step you took, you needed a permission because you're stopped on the way. Or mm. Why are you here? Or why are you there? So, so we transported our, ourselves to Demu. Uh -huh. 
Demi was an estate. It was it belonged to no, some nobility. A French nobility had to have a piece of land and a state attached to it. Mm -hmm. And it's always called a chateau, which means a castle, what a, sh a chateau, a palace, a castle. <laughs> a castle. Okay, some chateau, you wouldn't sleep the night <laughs> in them. This was one of these places with broken windows, with broken doors, with overground inside, person wasn't, but we paid rent for it. I, but it had a stable, it has an empty stable, but it has stable and it had gro uh, grounds. It had a place for chicken. And how many were you? About 80. 80. Okay. And so I remember arriving there at night, having to sleep there. So the Red Cross came through and brought us somehow. The Red Cross and the Quakers gave us some blankets. They were, you know, I know what we said. And we started cleaning up the place, bringing in electricity. There was no electricity. Fixing the pump outside, it wasn't working. Uh, and uh, and um, and and uh, we started preparing the ground. So I learned to cut the the hay with a scythe. You know, I learned to do that. And we got some chickens. We couldn't. I don't know if we ever got the eggs. It takes a while for the chicken to grow up. Whatever. This. And we got some cows for milk, and we got two oxen to plow the gr to plow the grow and uh, to transport the hay. And and, and it is the things I had to learn. I mean, I had to cut the hay, and then I had to pitch it, and I had to tie it. One we of a bunch of us doing this, and then put it. Um, on a, a, a on a flat bed, pile it up, attach the oxen, and sit on top of the hay, and get it will take a kind of a a, 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 a baton or a stick and get the oxen to go to the stable to unload all that stuff and so on. Regular regular farm life. Uh, yeah, but my father insisted on a full schedule for every child and every person. He had to, was no such issues. He, he was very strict about re religious items. Uh, you have, when you get up in the morning, you have to wash Nithilatya Dai, Negelwasser, you know, a certain way. There was no, it, it was ice water sometimes. We had to break the ice, but with the ice was so cold. But we had to do we had to do it. There were davening services, prayers. There were breakfast, not much food. Uh, chicory coffee it wasn't coffee. It was chicory, and uh, and. Uh, and uh, and and learning to, and working through the day, t teaching the younger ch the children, they were the teachers. They taught to everybody. Uh, had, the teachers had to learn. Everybody had to follow a schedule. But food was very very tight. Food I remember was one egg a, a, a month per person. You had to have, in order to get that, you had to have food cards, carte d'alimentation, food cards, in order to obtain that, because the farmers had to turn over all their stuff to the Germans. And but we, so we got it. It was an interesting part is when 
they decided to make a birthday party for my father. You a birthday party, you need a cake for the, for the party. You need cake, you need eggs. So people had to contribute that one egg. And then they had to have a boat, of which is the best baker, and bake this. But, but then everybody got a, a slice of that cake, okay? So it's your egg was, wasn't completely... It must have been quite a cake. It, 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 it was, was quite a cake. It was very, very good. We're, we've been speaking for about a little over an hour now. We're going to take a break. Okay. And we'll return shortly. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay we're back. And uh, we're going to be uh, continuing. Uh, Ms. Kalbach, you were speaking about uh, oh, the food in situation. Demu, when we were in Demu. Correct. And uh, I was telling you the problem was a real serious problem with food. And it was very serious for my brother because my mother was in charge of the. Uh, Pantry, and how to uh, how to uh, apportion the food for each day. What has to be saved? What can be given out, and so on. And uh, my group was larger group, a larger group. So there is, if there was not enough food, they knew not to tell me that it's my mother's problem. My mother is not giving the food, but my brother was. A younger, young boys, a young group, and they were hungry. And to them, my mother was in charge, and there is no food. That means she's not, and, and the food is locked up there, and it means that uh, she's she's not giving it. And maybe she's eating it herself. Who knows what they, uh, they were thinking? So I know my my brother was really hurt with with that situation. And one day, I caught him in the pantry. And I see he's picking up apples. And I think, oh my God, he's stealing food. And I know he would steal for his friends, not for him. I said, Sean, where, what are you doing? He says, I'm banging them. Let them start rotting so she'll give them out already. <laughs> You know, you had to make, you had to, used to give out the older ones that are already, there, you course, know. It, is, it, it was hard, it was very hard for him. For him. And so, and, and then, and we planted and we hoped to reap, but on the following uh, year, it was 43. 1943, beginning of the, of the year, around March time, we got notice from the French police, which my father had befriended in his usual way, with presents and smiles and so on, that they cannot longer protect us. And. And he asked him how many. They said you should you should leave because they they are going to come down looking for you in the Germans. So at that time, the Italians. It was at the time where King Emmanuel. What was it? Abdicated, and then the the uh, Italians had uh, occupied the eastern part southeast part of France, mm -hmm. and they had no problem with Jews like, like the Germans. So my father said, well, this, um, give, us, give us two days, give us two days and we, we, will, we will leave, try to keep everything safe for two days. And so it was the day before Purim, and the children had rehearsed a wonderful play and my father could not take take it away from him, and they celebrated Purim, and that night packed up and loaded everybody on camion on trucks, and went across 
from the west of France all to, to the east of France, to the Alps, to Grenoble, near Grenoble. Mm. The whole the whole group. Mm. So we somebody else ate what we planted, but we did not we did not reap reap it. So now we are in Grenoble and for a period of time it's safe until the politics started again and and uh, and I don't remember exactly the sequence with Mussolini and but but the story is that the Italians left France and the German came right in on their heels to occupy that, that, that area. And somehow they, whether it was a rumor or, the, or, or, or wishful thinking, so that, that the Italians were going to take us with them to Italy. We should follow them. We should go down to Nice. And from Nice to Italy, they're going to take us with them. So my father commandeered two huge trucks that we loaded everybody. And we're following the Italians to Nice. Beautiful highway from Grenoble to, uh, to uh, Nice. It's called Route Napoleon. Napoleon marched there, and uh, we, we we traveled the two trucks all together. We get we get to Nice. The, the Germans beat us to the. They're already there. The Italians had already left, and the Germans, the Germans were there, and the, and it wasn't just us who had this idea. It was. Most of the Jewish population still there, still in France, came, and Nice, all of a sudden, is were overrun, is full of, of Jewish people, and that's when the, the, the German, uh, took their famous physiognomist, and the name just escapes me. And who would just go on the street and pick up this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, this one? This one. Okay. We had we got separated. We had put our luggage, everything, all our possessions, in the lobby of a hotel. We came back to the hotel a couple. We went to look for a place where we could stay. There were so many people. We came back to the hotel. And. Everything was gone. Everything we had was taken. Everything that we took with us, the Germans were there and took everything already. So here we're left in Nice, and um, this historian that I mentioned before, Leon Polyakov, had underground connection resistance, and he helped finding places for everybody. And little by little, uh, people started going back north, where we came from, from near Voron, near Grenoble, because we felt at least we knew that area and we knew some of the peasants, and we knew. Them. So we had a director of the homes, Mr. Feist. And he decided he's not going to wait. He went to the uh, station, and there was one of somehow our children who also who tried to get away, and that 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 young man was caught by the German, and and this fast came in his defense, and they were both taken. We lost the right two people these two right away. We lost them. So everybody made their way north. 
except my father, myself, my my father, my mother, myself, my brother, and one of the young men who is now the chief rabbi in uh, Antwerp, David Lieberman. He stayed with us in Nice. We, we we were because so many Jews were in Nice. All of like a population doubled or tripled. There was no food on the to be had, and I remember the only thing we did eat for about two weeks is bread. We had butter and green peppers. Okay, what was this? And it came Rosh Hashanah, and we are still in Nice because they did not find somehow a safe way for, to get my father back, back north. And my, so we are in this, hidden in this house. My father tells his secretary, who was the contact for Leon Polyakov, that he's going to he'll blow chauffeur tomorrow on the first day of Rosh Hashanah. And Polyakov said, no way, you're going to alert everybody that you are here, that Jews are here. We didn't know what is it. My father, nothing doing. What what they did, what he did though, is we entered an inner little hallway that was inside the apartment, closed all the doors, and in the back of the house were tracks where actually we saw the, the German military with the armament going all the time, getting into in Italy. We waited for one of their trains, and when the train was rumbling, I made a lot of noise. My father blew the chauffeur. In the middle, there was a, a ring on the door, and it didn't open. My father was very sorry that he didn't open. He thinks it was another Jew who was there in the hidden in that same big building. Okay, and then comes already. Uh, I don't think we had a sukkah. I don't think we had an esrog. We didn't have that here. And, but there was a wonderful letter that my that is in the archives that I found, where my father is writing to his young men who are already back in in the, in the on the premises. Make sure you celebrate Shemchas Torah with great simcha. Don't like. Don't worry about me. You just. Do the great simcha. You have to put the, all the kochas into into a simcha. A wonderful letter. That, that's so typical of him. Uh, after much after I death after simcha started, somehow they uh, we there was a car that was, became available, and we started making our way north at night, and we were stopped. But they, a few times, but by the French on the arm, and somehow, the a miracle they were not the wrong kind. They looked at us. They, they say des Juifs, and we say, my father says, we, oui. and they said roule. It's something I want to tell you about my father, speaking of the Juif, they're asking, at what point we all, we, people were advocating for me to have a false uh, card identity, identification card with my name. My father didn't want to, finally he gave in. I got a card. My name was Marcel de Chantre. 
real French name. As my father hands me this card, he says, remember one thing, if they ask you if you are Jewish, there's only one answer, yes. You're not permitted to say that you're not Jewish. I guess that's the halacha. And I'm thinking to myself, dear father, what good is that car? <laughs> what good is that car? <laughs> Uh, you know, you, and uh, so we went back, and then we, uh, when we came back there, we could not be all together anymore in that chateau where we were, another chateau. We had to go hide and disperse ourselves and hide on specific farms. It was in the mountains. Started getting cold. I was in charge of a group. I had my own little farmhouse with another young girl, her name is Regine, who helped with the cooking, and I had was in charge of their teaching them. I have to teach Hamish, teach the davening, teach every, and I was in charge of um, their health, taking, make sure they're healthy, if they need medi medication. My parents were in another, in another place, and a group of young men and were in another place. And there were pro some of the other were little groups here and there hidden with the farm. And then we lost, we lost a group of the young men. Somebody, somebody betrayed us because my father always had to bribe and pay money for rent for the farmers and everything. I guess the word go out, went out that he had money or something, and probably could be that some of the French betrayed, uh, betrayed this group. So this group was deported. Huh? Was deported, and and somehow connected then with us. And then my parents had to change their place. Their cover was blown. Mm. Mm. So they changed. But my mother, with one of, I forgot his name, of course. One of the men went back for things that she had forgotten because they left in a hurry. And then the French milice caught her. And they started interrogating her about where my father is. And they also wanted to know where I was. They showed her a picture of me, and they wanted to know where I am. Uh, my, she told them my father went, is in Switzerland. She told him he left already. He's not here anymore. It's not true. Whatever. But they did not believe her, and they started a strange form of torture. First of all, they pistol whipped her, or the pistols hit her. Then they made her eat a piece of a cake of soap, bite into it and eat it. And then they made her eat a cup of, so, of, wa of water, no, of salt. They just put a little water in it, make it wet, and she had to eat that. At that time, the resistance and the French milice somehow they were exchanging people, and so my mother was in the in a deal where they let her to let her go. To let her go. 
how did that deal come about? Do you know anything about that? I don't know. I've heard different versions. I uh -huh. don't know which one is true. I don't know exactly the sequence, but I know that at the same time, the French resistance killed the head of the milice. The whole family, he killed them. And because as a, per, as a kid, I'm not such a kid anymore, I'm already, what, 16, 17? Uh, I was shocked that they killed the baby also. Hmm. The French resistance, that they killed the baby in a crib. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, but it was in a retaliation for something. Right. Whatever. So your mother was rescued from the police through this exchange? She let go through some of exchange. Mm. And then how much after, you, know, you saw her immediately after? She went home immediately, of uh, course? She went by Circuitous Road to rejoin my father. Right. And... Uh, a couple of months later, not much later, we were liberated. This was just close to the liberation time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you know uh, of those, um, that group that was betrayed and deported, how many of them survived? Did any survive? One came back. One. He, yeah. So you were liberated by the Americans. What do you? But the Americans. But we 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 never saw them really. We were mm -hmm. too high up in the mountain. Uh huh. Yeah. So you had you heard that huh? you heard that the, that the yeah. the area had been liberated and you came down. Yeah, but you know the radios were forbidden, but peasants they did have some hidden radios. We did you know we did know what's going on. There were some people that kept radios that listened to the radio. Mm -hmm. So this is how we knew that we were liberated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Throughout this time, um, you did you know if your father had contact with various rescue organizations at the time, the Varhat Sala, the the joint, or um, he was, was, he was in contact with well, still Jose. Money came, money came to from Jose. Mm -hmm. And which was not Jose anymore because everything had to be under one umbrella, Ujif, in France. And and then some money my father borrowed from whoever he could. Some money he borrowed from the people that he hid, that he rescued over the year, over the mm -hmm. time, and that he had to return after the war the money to them. He he did. And uh, uh, that, that was uh, then he he continued that 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 place in Waron stayed open as a children's home for a while because you know until there were other children that came in that but a lot of our children went to were uh, were smuggled into. Switzerland. Most my my whole group was smuggled one by one into Switzerland. Uh, a week ago, on did your did your father have relationships with Swiss rescue activists? But he had a relationship that was a good as his own Miller, mm -hmm. Avocat Miller. My father begged him that he should take care of the children. That he uh, that he sends that uh, smuggled mm -hmm. his children, and we have stories of children 
who were smuggled, who when they came, they refused to eat until they knew 100% it was kosher and huh. so on, mm -hmm. his children. A week ago, I got a call from a little boy who was in my group. Hmm. He's in Nebrak. He was there with his sister, Beatrice Dim. I'm telling her name because I want her name to be immortal because she was a six and a half, a seven year old child who took care of a five year old, four and a half year old, five year old brother like a mother couldn't take, to take, take care of him. I, she, she, she carried him. He was frail. She did everything, protected him. I heard later on, the brother told me also that in Switzerland, in one, in one of the places where they came, she, he was hungry, there was not enough food. She stole food for him, and she was beaten and put in... in, in Terrible things to her. She over this. They did to her. So your father worked with the uh, Goodesis Rule Miller. A little bit. Did little he work bit with bit anybody bit. else? Did he work with uh, no. any other names? That, no. You know? No. No. He, he was always an independent person. Right. 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 He, when he also. I want to tell you something. When he. When. When they gave him this document that he is their rabbi, when the group gave him the document that he is the rabbi, he started calling himself Grand Rabbi because the, the, they had a Grand Rabbi. He was right. part of the consistoire. Right. Did not relate at all to the other people. And then he figured he's not going to have a pool, you know, if he's not going to use a term to impress authorities and someone that he has, that he's in charge, that, you know. So he went, it's like holy chutzpah, you know. Of course. What is it? You know, he went this, with that, uh, yeah. What year did your father leave? Uh, did, did you all leave together, or did he stay on longer, or? Uh, Paris? Yeah. To go For back France. to Paris. France. To, no, France. We went. We went first. We were in Paris. Then my father wrote, I think it was eighty thousand letters that we were busy in the office sending to may to mayors from all the cities and hamlets in France, hmm. asking if they have any Jewish children that were hidden there. Hmm. We got some positive answers. We got some nasty answers, mm. but we did find some of the children, some children had in there that we managed to re reunite with, a, with, a, with some family that we found. And that was it. So we came here. I, we first came here in 1947. We came here to raise money to pay our debts that we incurred helping all these people. We were, my father came with me, we were, we were dismal at fundraising, dismal. We did, my father thought that he'll tell them what, was this, what it was like, what he'll tell them what he did, or the people that he saved, that they'll open the pocketbook and they'll say, here, 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 here. So he approached uh, these uh, Landsmannschaft that they have different shtetl from his own, where he was born from, my mother was born from. Landsmannschaft organizations in the United States. Organization here. Yeah. And they looked at him, then they gave him ten dollars, you know, and so on. He owed, he owed in the thousands. I met my husband over the year. I stayed here. My father returned. We 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 got money from the Germans for our furniture, that they, we had beautiful furniture that they took away. So they rested, they gave us restitution for the farmers for that. My father paid off everybody that he owed with his with personal money. And your father went back to France? After, yes, after I was married, he went back to France for a couple of years. You were married in which year? I was married in 49. 
And how long did he stay in France then? I can't say exactly. 53, 52, but I, you know. He only went back in 19, after 1950. He right, went back in right, 1951. Right, right. So maybe he stayed on 19. I don't know. I probably should can do research, but, but the right now, I, I don't know. I have a very bad memory for, for years and dates. Mm -hmm. But he had made a, a contact with uh, Jonas Tiefenbrunner, and there was a shidduch that was made between I, one of those I, I don't children. know. I heard this from you, but I, I don't <laughs> know. I interviewed them. Yeah. One, one of them was Yitzhak Wolf was with your father. Yeah. And it was, I think, in the uh, it was 1953 or so. I and think uh, Mrs. was to come become Mrs. Wolf was at. The, How old is Yitzhak Wolf the, now? I wonder if it's one of Yitzhak and... Wolf must be in his uh, mid to late 80s. Okay, so so he was one. That's why I was right. He was in Marseille, one of the boys who learned radio electronics with my with my father mm -hmm. uh, in my father's school. He was one of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh -huh. huh. And then your father came back in '53, and uh, what I did think he, he what missed. Did, what he, did he, he wanted to see his uh, his uh, grand my, was having another uh, daughter, so he, he wanted to be with the family here. Mm -hmm. Of course, he he had big projects here. Also, he started you know he started a school. An electronic school, a computer school. He started yeshiva. With a yeshiva, a yeshiva with elect with electronic half a day yeshiva, half a day electronics. Oh, and some, that's very very unusual. Huh? Very unusual. Yeah, because very he prescient. saw he he felt that people need professions. Some, so some of his people. People got degrees and got jobs in Princeton, electronics, and so on. Working, yeah. He he, uh, he 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 was a visionary. He always had he had a vision, and he was unstoppable. Uh, there was no playing devil's advocate with him. What if? What if? What if? You only had to see always the possibility that it can be done, not the problems around it. Mm -hmm. And always. And people ask me, was I afraid, was I scared? And, and I said, yes. And a few times when we were going from one place to another, I was very scared, but I also remember she said to me, it's okay to be scared. It's okay to be scared. You just have to do it anyway. Mm. It's not an embarrassment that you are scared, you know, but you got to do what you have to do. Mm. I understand that at one point when he was in France, uh, there was some discussion of him um, becoming the next uh, Lubavitcher Rebbe. I I didn't hear that in my house. I uh -huh. never heard it discussed. I never heard anything. Not my husband, nor my children. Nobody ever heard that. Uh -huh. I, I think it's a. It's That's written in sov several texts on your father, that he uh, he was approached. He had a few people that were very devoted to him. They were his Hasidim, but I. But look, my father knew that the, the Friedrich Rebbe had daughters here, two daughters, that they're, they're people, they're in line. There's no talk about it, you know. What's your sense of, it's interesting, your, your father uh, was, um, uh, was, a, was, was a rescue activist, was a very, very significant rescue activist. Yes, and um, and and there were many rescue ac activists at yes. the time from the religious world. Uh, 
different, various individuals, Nevada Tzala, in the Agudas Yisrael, and many of them belong both to the Nevada Tzala and the Agudas Yisrael. So few have been recognized by major institutions, uh, such as the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, um, although that is changing, uh, or Yad Vashem. What, what's your feeling on the, the absence of um, Jewish rescuers and I think I think there are instances in history where we can only say one word about a stupidity. I don't know. I, I, I cannot you know, I cannot see that Yad Vashem is hijacked by a few uh, people who veto this, you know, who, who make that policy that Jews who rescue Jews cannot be included. I mean, and, and the rest goes along with it. I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get it. People give their lives for it. Yeah, you know. It's curious. It's curious. Um, the argument there being that mm -hmm. uh, a Jew was in, in, in mortal danger all the time. You rescue, you, if you get caught, you get killed. If you don't rescue, if you get caught, you get killed. Whereas the Christian uh, puts their life at risk. Yeah. Uh, so that's the argument, or at least that seemed to be the argument, certainly yeah, well, in the 70s more or and or less, 80s. You know, in, in Poland, they would have been shot. In France, they would have been deported. There were different rules for different countries. Mm -hmm. that, uh, mm -hmm. And then later on in France, probably also shot and so on. But this really, it doesn't make sense. It just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you would like to add to this interview? Um, Mrs. Uh, Carl, yes. as we're as we're coming to a wind down of your of your, uh, your experiences as always on the move uh, in the first years, trains and then eventually mm. Israel or Palestine and and back to France and you know it, 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 personally it was very hard to adjust on a day to day normal normal life. I was so lucky that I had a positive husband, a, a, a person who looked for the good and things and the good in people and I was, and I was happy and, you know, and, uh, and so, so I, I, I snapped out of it, but it could have, it could have been much, much worse, could have been much worse. It's still, the first years, you live with guilt. You live with guilt for surviving. You figure, you, you worry about why you survived. Is there somebody in your place who didn't survive because you survived? I mean, is there numbers? What does it mean? So many. Uh, this, uh, why did you survive? Why? Like you felt, you felt, you felt guilty. When we were in uh, Voiron, at the time when I, uh, when everybody in my group was already in Switzerland, uh, the farmer's wife said, "Come, let's go pick berries in the in, in the woods right behind our house," and and we picked berries and we heard shots and then. Late, later on, I found out it's one of the people that we knew, that uh, a Belgian Jew, Heitner, who was who went on the street and and was and uh, was was killed. We, I don't even know who killed him. I I, I didn't think there was Nazis so close. The, 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 that the Germans were so good. most of the time they didn't come that high up on the mountains. I don't know the story. But, but, but I, I felt like guilty for it all the time. Here I'm hiding, 
and I'm okay, and he and he was killed. Well, it's time for Mashiach to come, and we we have to work on it to bring him. Ah, but Israel, that helps. And maybe Yad Vashem will figure that one out, okay, eventually. Thank you very much, Ms. Godot. Thank you for the opportunity.